Hello, and welcome back to Feeding His Sheep. In today's study, we're going to conclude Mark chapter 7, covering verses 14 through 37. I recently heard a story about two Southerners who went on a vacation to California, and one of them was talking to his friend about how Californians were able to discern where you were from by listening to you speak and listening to your accent. So he told his friend, he goes, watch this, and he goes into a grocery store, and they walked in there, and the first man says, I want some taters, maters, and nanners. The clerk says, okay, I'll get your potatoes, your tomatoes, and your bananas right away, sir. How are things back in Oklahoma? Well, the second man was just astonished, you know, so he wanted to give this a try. So he goes out and goes into the building right next to that one and says the same thing. I want taters, maters, and nanners. The clerk says, you must be from Arkansas. He goes, was it my accent that give it away? And he goes, no, sir, you're in a hardware store. Now, if you're from Arkansas, don't get mad at me. This was just a joke and an illustration. It doesn't matter how well you match the clothing or the hairstyles and the dress of a surrounding culture. You can try to blend in and look just like the people around you and you might even succeed to a point, but if you are from the South as I am, the minute that you open your mouth, people will instantly know you're not from there. Peter had this problem one time. When Jesus was arrested, Peter was faithful enough to follow at a distance to see what was happening, but not quite brave enough to admit that he was with Jesus. When he tried to blend in with the crowd that was around the fire, people just kept asking and kept asking if he was with Jesus, and something kept giving it away. In Matthew 26, 73, a little later the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too are one of them for even the way you talk gives you away. Now our study today is not accents or dialects. Rather it's about being known as in who you are and who you belong to by the things that proceed out of your mouth and by the actions that you do. Again in Matthew 12 verses 33 and 34, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. What would happen if somebody was to watch a video of your life and they had the closed captions turned on or they read the transcript? Would they be able to examine your speech and know instantly that you belong to God? Or would they say like Jesus just said to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers? You know, I have a good friend that's of the Muslim faith, and from time to time we have discussions back and forth about the similarities of our faith and the differences of our faith. And I have noticed that he abstains from pork and other foods that are not allowed by his religion. But when this man speaks, just for an example, last week I counted eight swear words within a single sentence. I mean, every sentence is colorfully sprinkled by profanity. And at first I thought to myself, if you're not adhering to any of the other tenets of your faith, such as pure speech, abstaining from raunchy music, or other illicit behavior, why bother abstaining from certain foods? I mean, after all, can a ham sandwich really be worse for you on Judgment Day than dropping 3,000 swear words per day? But then I also remembered something else that Jesus said in Luke 6:41. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? You know, on Judgment Day, I'm not going to give an account for anybody but me. You're not going to give an account for anybody but you. And I need to examine myself with that same scrutiny. If I was on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Would my speech let people know that I belong to Christ? Because I don't know about you, but I would rather feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb rather than trying to get maters, taters, and nanners in a hardware store. So as we conclude the seventh chapter of Mark, we begin with finding the source of our external failures, such as sinful speech, but also attitudes and actions. And knowing what the source is, it can help us to better tackle the problem by focusing on the source of the sickness. Not just treating the symptoms, but going for the source. So hopefully the passage that we're studying today will help us have better victory over our sinful nature that we've all been experiencing. So we'll go ahead and begin in verses 14 through 16 of Mark chapter 7. 
After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus had just finished destroying the accusations that the Pharisees had made against him and the disciples. They were accusing him and them of not following their ceremonial hand-washing rituals. Now, in last week's study of the first 13 verses, we went into detail about how they had literally formed a new religion that just was under the name of Judaism. They had several of their own books that were full of traditions from their forefathers. These books and traditions, they were given more authority than God's word in their own eyes. Jesus had never broke the Mosaic law. Every accusation that these Pharisees had flung at him was not a violation of God's law. Jesus never sinned. The things he was accused of was breaking their man-made traditions, traditions that they held in higher esteem than the commandments of God. And hand washing was one of them, as we discovered last time. We know that you don't eat with dirty, nasty hands or you're going to get sick. I've seen guys eat sandwiches with grease and oil on their hands. Maybe 5W30 is a good nutrient. I don't know. And then they'll cut an apple with the same knife that they cleaned their fingernails with five minutes ago. That's not the kind of unclean hands I'm talking about. They were referring to ceremonial hand cleansing. That They believed you had to do that to make yourself acceptable to God. In their eyes, eating without performing their man-made ritual was defiling yourself and committing one of the most atrocious sins. So Jesus turns from the Pharisees and then he calls the crowd back to him. He's not done with this point yet. See, the Pharisees had placed this burden on the people and all of their rituals and traditions that they added were making life unbearable. There's just too much stuff to remember from the Midrash, the Torah, the, all of these books that they've had. So Jesus makes a statement that is shocking to all of those who hear. And those Pharisees must have still been within earshot because if they wanted to find something to accuse him of, this was about to be better than any hand-washing accusation ever was. Jesus, the Son of God, was about to declare all foods clean. Now, as the Son of God and the co-creator of the universe, he had the right to do so. God had never intended for the laws that were strictly ceremonial to become what the, pri the priest and the Pharisees had morphed these things into. Now, let us not forget also at the same time that the Pharisees were adding all of these restrictions and rules and imposing them on the common people, they themselves were also busy creating loopholes in God's law so that they can enforce their own. Also in the previous study, Jesus exposed their misuse of the act of declaring something Corbin. Corbin was something that was dedicated to God. It's a way that you could dedicate your finances to the tabernacle or to the temple in the event of your demise, like a modern version of a last will and testament. But in the act of declaring their money and their possessions Corbin, they created a loophole, or so they thought, around God's law that commanded them to care for their elderly parents. Now, I'm not going to get into detail here, but Jesus made it clear that they had manipulated the law and they had manipulated this loophole trying to get around it. And he said that they had done many things such as that. That wasn't an isolated incident. So enough was enough. It's time to even lift the dietary restrictions. Now, the dietary restrictions were handed down to the people by God long ago through Moses. Well, actually, the first dietary restriction was in the Garden of Eden when God says, do not eat of the fruit of that tree. Man, and what do we do? We sin. But before sending his people out of Egypt into a pagan land that was filled with all kinds of idols and perversions, God needed a way to separate them from the rest of the world. And one way of doing so is dietary laws. By eliminating certain items from the menu, they would stick together as a nation rather than blending in among the Canaanites and therefore adopting all kinds of wicked things from them. But what did they do shortly after entering the land? They kept many of the 
foreign idols of the Canaanites anyway. Now, another reason for abstaining from certain foods was health reasons. We all know that undercooked pork can be dangerous. So what better way to keep a primitive nation safe when they were relying upon wood-fired clay ovens for cooking? You know, it's potentially dangerous food. Also included in the law are several other things about general cleanliness. There's regulations about mold for cleansing things with mildew. I mean, both of these have also have serious health risk if not handled correctly. So God had his reasons for initially restricting the diets of the people. But the mess that the Pharisees had made was the straw that broke the camel's back and things were about to change. And if you were a first century Jew at this time, this was a very radical change. Jesus had just said that the things that go into your mouth are not what make you unclean, but rather what comes out of it. Now, I know anybody could easily understand the part about things coming out of you, defiling you. Anybody could see that makes sense. But this thing that he just said about food that you eat, not defiling you, could this really be what they meant? I mean, the disciples decided they better make sure before they went out and ordered a bacon cheeseburger just yet, because this was a radical change. So this explains the confusion that we see in them as we go into verses 17 through 19. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. We've seen before where Jesus had to explain in further detail to the disciples something that he had previously said. So he asked them here in the same way, are you also lacking in understanding? Well, of course not. They understood what he had said. The Pharisees had understood what he had said. They got it. They just couldn't get it to sink in. They can't wrap their minds around this and process this yet. You know, their whole life and many generations before them, their fathers and their grandfathers all the way back had always tried to adhere to the law given by God. They had never eaten anything that was unclean. Since many of these disciples were fishermen, this also meant they had to be careful with certain fish and certain types too. As for example, the only seafood that was clean was fish that had fins and scales. You think, well, that's all of them, isn't it? No. Have you ever tried to eat eel? I don't ever plan on trying eel, so I would be okay with that. But I gotta admit, I have a sweet spot for fried catfish, but catfish has no scales. They would be considered unclean. And then shrimp. You know. I've nearly bankrupted several restaurants that foolishly advertised all-you-can-eat shrimp. I'm probably the reason why some of the Red Lobster places around me stopped their endless shrimp month. The last time they literally closed the restaurant around me, I had to lift my feet so the cleaning guy could vacuum underneath the table. I was getting my money's worth, but shrimp was also considered unclean. So the fishermen also had their regulations that they had to go by with what they could eat that they drew out of the water. But ever since any of these guys could remember. Their parents, the synagogue leaders, everybody had driven it into their heads that nothing unclean should ever pass through their lips. That was life to them. This change was just too big to grasp. And I believe that Peter struggled with this for the rest of his life. Much later on, we see Peter still struggling to grasp the idea that all foods are now okay. In the book of Acts, much later in chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. 
What is it with Peter and things having to happen three times? He denied Christ three times. He had to answer Jesus' question three times to be restored. And then at three times, this vision had to be repeated for him. Maybe he's just thick-headed. It takes a lot to get through Peter's skull. So we know that the disciples heard him. We know that they knew what Jesus meant. They just could not get past this idea that everything has changed. That's why many years later, as Peter is reciting these events for Mark to write down in the gospel, it was included for us in parentheses by Mark, that part where it said, thus he declared all foods clean. I think Peter still struggled with that, but Mark felt that he needed to clarify for the reader, so he included this. So Matthew also records more of how the conversation went when Jesus explains it further to them and shows us that Peter was the one struggling the most with this. In Matthew 15, beginning in verse 12, then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. So we see that it was Peter who needed the extra clarification here. This was life-changing news and he just could not accept it yet. We'll go ahead and go on into verses 20 through 23 of Mark 7. And he was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. So now we're getting to the source of defilement. Now we go from the old covenant to the new covenant. What you eat is not going to make you unacceptable to God. What you eat is not sinful. Unless you're putting pineapple on pizza. To me, that's a gray area. That, that That's borderline. No, I'm kidding. Rather, it's what comes out of your mouth that makes you sinful, not what goes in. Even the things that are in your mind, the things that you verbally express, and any sin that's committed by action or by thought or by speech, all of those things, every single sin is conceived and hatched in one place, in your heart. I find it interesting that it doesn't say in your mind. You know, it's your brain that does the thinking. It's your brain that does the processing. But Jesus said these things come from the heart. Not referring to that pumping organ that's inside your rib cage, but your core, your innermost part, the place of you where your emotions lie, the place that drives you to do things and drives you to say things. Now, when your heart is wrong, everything that comes out of you is wrong. Jesus goes on to mention a whole list of sins, and all of these things that he mentions, they manifest themselves in speech, thought, and deed, but every single one of them is hatched in the heart. When Jesus was preaching, he had said that thou had heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that if you lust after someone within your mind or within your heart, you've already committed adultery. He had added to these things. You know, nobody accidentally has an affair. They begin by allowing things into their heart that should not be there. You know, whether it be flirtation or whatever it might be, they'll treasure this in their heart and then they'll ponder in their mind how to make it happen and then then the physical act happens. Jesus also said in that same sermon that if you're angry with your brother, you are guilty of murder. You know, you may not commit the actual physical crime, but if it's already happened within your heart, it's only an impulse away. And God knows this. This is why Jesus expounded on these things on the Sermon on the Mount. Because God knows that when these things are conceived in your heart, each sin is just an impulse away. That's why he tried to warn Cain when Cain became angry with his brother. In Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Every sin that you commit has its beginning in your heart. 
It all starts there, and you didn't even realize it. Now, let me make one thing clear. The second that you are saved, the second that you begin to follow Jesus, your sin record might be expunged and your record clean in heaven, but your heart still needs a lot of work. Don't expect it to be perfect. Don't be discouraged or doubt your salvation just because your heart is still bad. Your heart isn't instantly transformed into perfection. We must constantly be aware of the condition of our heart. We must ask God to renew it daily. This will be a lifelong process that's only completed when we are called home. We must renew our heart. We must keep it clean by watching what we allow to enter it. So instead of watching the foods that you take in and deciding is this clean or is this unclean, be careful about what you let your heart take in as far as entertainment, the things you read, the things you watch, the things that you associate associate yourself with, the people that you hang around. Make sure these things are pure. Now, when it comes to food, potato chips and junk food, they can sometimes be irresistible. Well, sin is always pleasurable for a season. Isn't that what scripture says? But junk food will have negative effects on your body and on your health. Well, at the same time, if you fill your heart with junk and the things of the world, you know, your spiritual health is going to take a hit. Guard what your eyes and ears are taking in because those things go straight to your heart. Consider your heart like a computer. A computer only puts out data that was put into it. Data in, data out. Now, if you fill your eyes and ears and therefore your heart with worldly sinful junk, don't sit there and wonder why worldly sinful junk comes out of your mouth and is expressed in your deeds and thoughts. So now that we're aware of where the battle begins and where the biggest problem lies, which is in our heart, we can better address the problem of sin in our life. If you're struggling with a certain sin that just keeps popping up and it's a besetting sin you just you constantly struggle with it begin there figure out how it's getting into your heart and then you can cut it off at the root let's continue on in verses 24 through 30 Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre and when he had entered a house he wanted no one to know of it yet he could not escape notice but after hearing of him a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet now the woman was a Gentile, the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. As usual, every time Jesus went somewhere, someone would pop up and want a miracle or want a healing. Verse 24 said that he wanted no one to know that he was there. And it's not that he didn't care to help. Jesus always shows compassion to people who are in need. But we need to remember this is not the reason he was here. This was not the reason and the purpose of his ministry. Hardly anyone in these crowds was following him for his teaching or caring about the words of eternal life. They just wanted to be cured of something that had ailed them their whole life. And there's nothing wrong with needing and asking for help, but it seems like, like it's all anyone ever wanted. And we must also never forget that Jesus, though he was 100% divine, was at the same time 100% human during his incarnations. That means he grew weary sometimes. Like you and I, he grew exhausted from time to time and needed rest. And here comes this woman. The text says she was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. Other gospels say that she's a Canaanite. Well, no big deal. It just said he was in Tyre. There's nothing shocking about finding a Gentile person in Gentile territory. But some people viewed those of the Phoenician background with a little bit of distrust because of one Phoenician queen so long ago by the name of Jezebel. You automatically associate that name with wickedness, don't you? That woman single-handedly did more than anybody in Israel's history to incorporate Baal worship among the people. But this woman in this text is no Baal worshiper. Though she is a Gentile, she obviously knows who Jesus is. I like her description in Matthew 15, 22. It says, And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, son of David. 
My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. So that sounds like she has a good understanding of exactly who Jesus is. Her theology is sound so far, and she has a legitimate issue. Her child was plagued by a demon, and like any loving parent, they would do anything to help them. You can hear the passion in her plea as she begs for Jesus to help. And in verse 26, it says she kept asking him. If you look at the other gospel accounts, you see a lot of repetition here. She kept asking and kept asking and kept asking a lot. Back to Matthew in 15, 23, it says, but he did not answer her a word and his disciples came and implored him saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. So Jesus finally addresses her, but not in the way that we would expect him to. He said, let the children be satisfied first, meaning that he was sent to the children of Israel first, the children of Abraham first. The Messiah was promised to the people of God first, and then he would go on to the Gentile nations. He's not ignoring her for the purpose of being rude. Often when Jesus did or said something unexpected, why was it? because it was a test. Remember back earlier in Mark when they were in a boat in the storm and the ship was about to sink, the water's crashing in on the sides, they're panicking for their lives and Jesus is asleep on a cushion in the front of the boat? Is it because he didn't care what happened to the disciples? No, it's a test. When they lowered the paralytic down through the roof expecting him to be healed and Jesus says, your faith has saved you, your sins are forgiven, but he didn't say get up and walk yet. Do you think it's because he didn't have the ability or he didn't care that that wasn't the man's thing? No, it was a test and it's a teachable moment. When he told the disciples to feed 5,000 men, do you think Jesus intended to watch them struggle trying to do the impossible in the strength of the flesh, um, human effort trying to gather enough money to feed these people? No, it was a test. It was a teachable moment and an example. And that could well be the whole reason for this trip to Tyre was the purpose of encountering this woman to help her. Because in the next few verses, Jesus is leaving Tyre and going on to other places. So this woman, this event right here could be the entire reason for the stop in Tyre. So Jesus knows what he is doing when he is ignoring her. He is not being rude. The reason for this repeated cold shoulder is to expose the amazing faith that this Gentile woman had and a greater faith than many of the Israelites and even some of the disciples had. Besides calling him Lord and Son of David, which is a messianic title, by the way, she also understood her role as a Gentile at that time. So Jesus had just told her, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now you've got to admit that phrase right there probably didn't sit right with you. That seems like an insult. What he was meaning is, is his ministry was primarily for the children of Israel first. Now in our modern culture, what he said would hurt a lot of people's feelings, wouldn't it? We consider that a brutal insult. I don't suggest that you go up to a female stranger and call her a dog. You know, tell me how that works out for you if you do that. One pastor that I listened to said that the word that he used for dog here translates to little house dog or puppy. So it's a little bit calmer. It's a, not too awful, but still it sounds odd to us today, doesn't it? Why did he say this? Why did he say it's not right to give this to the dogs? Was he calling her a dog? Was Jesus insulting this woman? First, think to the character of Jesus. Was that the way that he does things? No. Also, look to this woman's response. She didn't take this as an offense. Her reply was, she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. She understood that the Messiah was to minister to Israel first, but she also understood that God cares for the Gentiles who believe in him. She was okay with even the crumbs that fell underneath the table. She was not offended by her position in in that culture. You know, the temple in those days were divided into three courts. The outer court was as far as the women and the Gentiles could go. Only Jewish males were allowed to enter the second part, or the inner court. And only the high priest was allowed to enter the center part, which was the Holy of Holies. Now, as a Gentile myself, I would be honored just to stand at the gate of the temple of God, to stand on a hill far away and just take in its sight and to look at it, just to be as near to him as I could. 
Now, of course, now, today, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. We, as the church, are a melting pot. We're a mixture of male and female, Jew and Gentile, free and bondservant. You know, we are all the same in God's eyes now. But the faith that this woman showed at this time in Jesus' ministry, along with her humility, stood out for everyone to see that day. The disciples were thinking that she was a pest. They had asked for Jesus to send her away. But I think Jesus knew her faith and knew what was about to happen. It was going to be a lesson that we would still examine and talk about thousands of years later, as we're doing right now. Matthew records a bit more of the emotion than Mark does. So we're going to bounce back over to him and look at the record of Jesus' response. In Matthew 15, 28, Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. The hearts of the disciples wanted her to hush up, wanted her to leave him alone. Her heart was willing to humbly acknowledge her unworthiness and her lowly position before God and humbly ask for mercy. Having just covered Jewish ceremonial traditions a few verses ago, I ask you whose heart was truly defiled in this case. It definitely wasn't that of the woman. She had a humble heart. She knew her standing and her lowly position before God and humbly asked for mercy. So let's continue on in verses 31 through 37. And again he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting he touched his tongue with the saliva, and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Epaphta, which is, be opened. And and his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So now we're back in the region of Decapolis, which means ten cities. If you remember from our study in chapter 5, we have been in this area before, in uh, Gerasa and Gadara. This is where Jesus healed the demoniac, the man who had a legion of demons who was living amongst the tombs and was deranged. After Jesus healed him, the man wanted to come back with him, but Jesus told him, no, you go into the city and you tell everybody what has happened here today. So we remember in Mark 5, the man went through the Decapolis, again, which is the ten cities, and he spoke of the things that Jesus has done. The names of these cities are Scythopolis, Gerasa, and Gadara, where the demon-possessed man was, Hippos, Damascus, Dion, Canatha, Raphana, Pella, and Philadelphia. Now, the man who had wanted to follow Jesus, but Jesus told him no, that he should go and tell the others, did. And now we see why he did that. The pages of scripture here are bringing us along to see if anyone in that area has heard about Jesus, if anybody has heard this man's testimony. And sure enough, the crowds had. This man had gone in and was obedient and told everybody what had happened. The crowds brought a man to him and implored him to lay his hands on them. Now, normally when Jesus healed someone, he usually done it in the way that they hoped they would. I've noticed this pattern. There was the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. How did she believe that she was going to be healed? It says that she thought within herself that if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she was. You know, there was Jairus who wanted him to go and lay hands on his dying daughter. And Jesus went along and was going to do that. He could have just said the word and healed her from the distance. There was the centurion who had the sick servant. And Jesus says, okay, I'll go there. And he says, I'm not worthy to have you in my house, Lord, but I know that you are a man of authority. And if you say that he will be healed, he will be healed. And Jesus is like, do you hear the faith of this man? There is no one in Israel with such faith. And he healed him from a distance. You know, usually he'd done these miracles in the way that the people expressed their faith. There's no power in the methods. There's no power in touching 
touching the hem of a garment. The power was in Jesus. Now these people ask him, lay your hands on this guy and cure him. They knew that Jesus could cure him. I mean, he drove thousands of demons out of the guy with a single command. This should be easy. So they said, just lay your hands on him. That's all you got to do. But look at the way Jesus did this. He took this guy to the side. He put his fingers into his ears. And then after spitting, he touched the guy's tongue with the saliva. And then he looked up into heaven and with a deep sigh said, Ephatha. Now, why did he do it that way? You know, or why did he heal the, the blind man in this similar way, spitting in the dirt and making mud and then rubbing it on the guy's eyes? You know, God works in ways that sometimes make no sense to us. We're not given a reason why he done this case with the deaf mute man different. We're not told why he cured that blind man in a different way, but maybe that's why. It could be to throw us off because you don't want to see people trying to mimic this. You don't go into an eye doctor's place and have them spit in the mud and rub the mud in your eyes. You don't go to a hearing doctor and hearing him spit on the ground, take this, put it on your tongue. You know, if you go into a doctor's office and they try doing these things, you know, just get out of there. You don't want to go to an eye doctor who's going to work out of a van in an alley and tell you to bite down on a rag to stifle the screaming. No, get up and run. It's nothing to do with this technique. There's nothing that we can do to mimic this. And it has everything to do with the power of God. And that was the whole purpose of these miracles that Jesus done. These miracles were to back up and verify his ministry and his claim as being from God the Father. That's it. So perhaps that's why we see the detail that said, with a deep sigh, Jesus done this. It's always the same thing everywhere he goes. Miracles, miracles, miracles. And the crowds are just growing larger and hindering him from getting his real mission accomplished. That's why he had ordered their silence. You know, he wanted the man to tell them in Decapolis so that they may know that God has come down to man, so that they may know that salvation is available for anyone. Nobody would have thought that this deranged man full of a legion of demons could be saved, but he was. There is deliverance from evil. This man had been exercised of all those demons. But all they want about and care about is temporary things. So in an attempt to keep the crowds from getting worse, he gave them that command in 736 of Mark. He gave them the orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. Isn't that odd how things have flipped since those days? He told the people not to tell anybody and they told everybody. But yet today, he tells us to tell everybody, and we tell nobody. I think that makes us just as bad, if not worse, than those fickle crowds who just wanted to see what they could get from Jesus. What he gives us is eternal redemption salvation, eternal life in his presence in heaven. Now that is news that should be taken and run with. That is something that we as a child of God should never be silent about. Join us next time as we begin chapter 8 of the Gospel of Mark.